Okay, so this chapter wraps up the OOP section of the book, and the chapter is about trade-offs, like what should you use? S3, R6, S4, there's all these things. And upcoming now, we're going to have S7. Uh, so the goal here is to try to understand some of these trade-offs, and then I'm going to also do a kind of a brief, or maybe not so brief, but it is brief. It's just a quick intro into S7, what it is about the object system, formerly known as R7 for a while. <laughs> Now it's called S7. So at the time of the writing of Advanced R, there was three OOP systems. Well, three main ones, as Hadley says in that little YouTube talk where he talks about S7, he says there's actually a large number of OOP systems out on CRAN, but there's three main ones that are used. And at this time, the like I said on the Slack, the too long don't listen version of this whole chapter is, um, just use S3 <laughs> by default, unless you have a good reason to switch to using uh, the other two or even S7. And he does make this point, which I thought was useful enough to put into a separate bullet point. He says, if you have experience with other languages like Python or Java or even JavaScript, you might be very tempted to use R6 because it's gonna seem a lot more like the OOP that you're used to than S3. And he says, don't do that, <laughs> even though it'll feel more familiar. Stick with the functional style because that, that mesh is much better with the way R works, especially with the reference semantics. On the other hand, I, I guess I'm kind of uh, getting ahead of myself, but I will just mention that if you do need reference sem semantics, then probably that's the time you might want to. If you're sure you need reference semantics, we'll get into that though. So the first comparison is a very quick part of this chapter is S4 versus S3. And you know, he basically says, look, S3 is simple, flexible, it's great for small teams. Um, it's used all throughout R and CRAN. Um, you should probably be using it if you're going to do some simple OOP stuff, because most of our small teams um, he does say that for more complex systems, though, you will run into trouble because it's too flexible, and your teams will have to come up with their own uh, conventions to deal with the complexity. So if you get to that point, then it's worth considering S4 or maybe now S7. But um, but S4 is specifically used for large projects and large teams because it's got a built-in strictness, a bit built-in formality, um, does require a lot of upfront investment in design, figuring out what your class hierarchies are gonna be and what different objects are gonna be and all the different little validators and everything. But once you do, the payoff there is big for that team. Everybody making sure that they're talking the same language, so to speak. He does mention this one at last aspect. He says that one of the issues with S4 is that not only is it complicated, but the documentation kind of sucks. <laughs> it's spread all over the place and it's not very good. He says the S3 documentation also is not good, but you don't really need it because there's not much to it. So that's, that was basically the bottom line. So my interpretation of this section was don't use S4 unless you're a bioconductor. <laughs> that's kind of like, a, that's the really short version. Probably not quite right, but that's my short version. So that brings us to, uh, S, uh, R6, R6 we talked about before, it's built on this encapsulated object system rather than generic functions, right? And so the big difference is there's some, uh, the big trade-offs here are that generics in S3 are regular functions, they live in the global namespace, right? Whereas the R6 methods belong to objects and they live in some local namespace. And this, as we'll see, has some trade-offs. The um, R6, reference semantics, right, allow, um, simplify some issues with state. If you have a lot of, uh, if you're dealing with things that involve state, then the reference semantics of R6 can help make things more straightforward and more less painful. For example, in like a web server or, um, I can't think of another good example, but in a web server it came to my mind, <laughs> or a database, another example, right? Interacting with a database. You can do it in a functional way, but maybe it might be easier with R6 reference semantics. Uh, finally, and this is just a minor point that you invoke an R6 method using this dollar sign. Um, and if you return these invisible cells, you can chain these things along, which is kind of an alternative to, to using the pipe, which is a functional way of doing that. So, so for the name, go ahead. I had, I had a question about like that threading state uh, like that comment that he made about threading state. And I wanted to see if the group had any more insight. On I have it. more so, to say. I have another chart just oh, on the threading okay. state. That was oh, kind of like okay, the intro. Cool. All right. That was let's, the intro. And then I'm going to go through those three things uh, real quickly. All right. So um, I will bring my question up when we get through that one. Cool. So the namespacing thing is, again, in S3, generics are just functions in the global namespace. 
And that the advantage there is you have a unit, you can have a uniform API. We all take advantage of that summary, predict, fit, right? Print, the most common one, generic, right? Uh, so if you get a model back from your tidy model, you know how to deal with it. Doesn't matter who wrote the model, if they, as long as they implemented the same generics, the same API, it, it all works nicely. There is a disadvantage of that, as you mentioned, is that you have to be careful about creating new methods, new generics. You can't, oh, I'm producing a library for how to rob banks, so I'm going to have this function called plot. Well, it's, everyone's going to be confused because you already, plot means something else in every other context, right? Whereas in R6, you can avoid, you have the local scope, which basically has the opposite, right? Now we have local, the advantages are we don't have this problem. We can just have uh, bank heist dollar sign plot, right? It's no way to confuse that with, you know, uh, something else plot, like uh, I can't think of an example, novel plot or whatever, right? So those all obviously have clear meanings because of the way the uh, encapsulated methods work. Um, and again, the disadvantage is again the opposite. You have to like know that particular object class, what its methods are, and they can you can have by convention have a uniform API between those two, but it has to be a convention, right? Or with some kind of subclassing or something like that. But so that was namespacing. Uh, now the threading state thing. Um, the issue here is that in a functional approach, it sometimes can be challenging to deal with state because you not if you don't you're not going to allow for side effects. Right, then you have to thread the state through all your function calls. This is an example here where we create a new S3 object uh, called stack. We're going to create a stack, right? So it just and then create an S3 object. We just need to make a little structure. Uh, we're going to store the items in a list, and we call it a stack, right? We're not. He doesn't actually implement a generic, so this class part doesn't actually matter. Uh, he just doesn't don't need that for this. But you define a function push which takes um, a stack and something to push onto it and just adds it to the list, right? And returns the, um, the item, returns the, the new list. So that's no problem, right? So you, when you push an item, I get the list back. I can just keep threading that. I can keep my handle on the new stack X that comes back, no issue with that. I can just say X goes to push X three or something like that, right? No problem. The problem is when you want to pop a value, now you're going to get a new stack back and a value. You need to get both back. And the one way to do that is to put them both in a list and return the list. But now I have to unpack that list, right? And so the usage is a bit awkward. Like, so here's a new stack. I push a couple of values onto it. Then when I want to pop it, I get this out thing, which is actually a list that has both the new stack, which I can now update the stack. But I had to do an extra step here and remember to do it. And I can also take a look at the item that came back 20, right? So that's a little awkward. Many or almost every functional language that I'm aware of is where they know about this problem and they've solved this with a syntactic sugar. Uh, for example, in Python or even in C++, there's these things called structured bindings where basically you can just, re I didn't put an example in here, but you can just return back. You can assign to a pair of variables, right? Um, I should have wrote that in here, but instead of writing all this, I would just write S comma value equals whatever the, or arrow push or pop S, right? called structured binding. Um, and if you wanna, I should have said more, but I didn't wanna belabor too much. Uh, he gives an example in the book and there's this, also this nice vignette you can look at, um, this uh, called unpacking assignment, which uses this uh, R package called Zella, which allows you to do that. It has a little funny special operator instead of that left arrow, left arrow with percent signs or something, I think that returns these, that works with this library. Uh, but you can avoid all this if you know for sure you're gonna be dealing with states. Maybe a stack is better off as an R6 object than it has an internal state and it updates that state, has reference semantics now. So we can define a stack as an R6 object, R6 class, right? So it has the item stored in a list and it has a function for pushing and a function for pulling. But in each case, uh, when you push, it just returns itself invisibly. When you pop, it just returns the item. It doesn't return to self, okay? But um, no, you don't need it because self automatically updates. That's the reference semantics part of it, sort of, right? It's automatically being updated. And so it looks a little bit cleaner, right? I can just say, okay, uh, S is stack. I can push, 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 and pop. No problem. S is updated all along uh, without me having to worry about threading the state through. It's both, it's sort of an advantage and a disadvantage. The disadvantage is that you have to, well, the, the advantage is pretty clear, right? I just, yeah, it seems to match better what, how I think a stack should work. The disadvantage is, you do have this reference semantics, which sometimes you can lose track of. 
what's happening to S, <laughs> right? Oh, wait, is that, especially if you're using other functions in R that don't do this. In Python, I run into this problem all the time. There's some functions in pandas that update the panda, the, the data frame there's in, in place and others don't. And they even have little argue, extra arguments. You can say in place equals true to force it to do it in place. So that leads to all kinds of errors and confusion, which I just did yesterday, for example. So my question with this yes. one was, go. does this go back to like, so there was an exercise in R6 that it asked like, why can't you model a bank account or a deck of cards with an S3 class? Is it basically because of this threading state issue? Like, I mean, the answer is you can model a bank account and a deck of cards. You just have to keep track of the state yourself and keep threading it around. It's, it causes some cognitive dissonance when you do it, right? It's like, <laughs> it's frustrating. Okay, that makes sense. Because I was uh, like, I was kind of going like thinking back to that question of like, okay, well, why is that the case? And it's because R6 is better at modeling those types of things because it's encapsulated, right? The values are encapsulated within the, the class object. But then if you're using S3, you can use S3 to do it, but then yeah. you would just have to do those extra additional steps. Yeah, just like when you're doing with um, Tidyverse, right? You always have to keep saving your, you know, Right, so we use that pipe thing to thread all these things together, but then you still have to like save it, keep remembering to save your uh, data frame, right, your tibble. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's what I was kind of wondering. So uh, excellent. That's that that makes. But sense. I don't know how many times you. I mean, I've quite often forgotten to assign the results or something to a tibble in R, and then I'm like, oh, why didn't it work? I'm like, oh, I forgot to actually. I just did. <laughs> I did all the mutations and everything else, but I didn't actually put it anywhere. I just print it out of my stupid line and command line, right? Makes sense. Um, but this threading state in, in a functional way like that is kind of painful. I mean, like, uh, for example, the programming language Haskell, which is a purely functional programming language, which doesn't have a concept of state, no reference semantics. Uh, it doesn't, you can get reference semantics by using some, um, some more advanced tricks, but the basic way it's supposed to work is without any reference semantics. So they, they have worked out these complicated, not complicated, but well, seemingly complicated things like monads and monad transformers and everything else to deal with passing state around to make it a little bit easier. So even doing the destructured um, assignment doesn't make it that much easier. It's still kind of a pain. So they invented some more advanced ways to take care of the threading of the state automatically behind the scenes. So if we go back up to like the S3 example of this, um, yeah. this like stack example, like, so when we go to the use of, you know, and we look at like how awkward it is, like we have to do that assignment S is another argument for using R6, the fact that like that, that object that's being referenced by S is kind of safe because it's encapsulated within the R6, like yeah, environment. S, yeah, I think so. I mean, because you're saying S represents an actual, an important entity, the stack, right? I don't have, I don't have more than one stack. I just have the stack. Right, but here it's very, I can easily end up with like three or four stacks where I just do a different things to, right? Cause yeah, and, it, copy. and it's global, right? It's yeah. like global to yeah. your, it's global to the code that you have. So like yeah. anything could influence what that S is. So R6 would be safer in this case because you could have a stack that's, I mean, safe in the fact that you could set it as like a private field where nothing can access it. Like you knew for a fact that it's locked down. So yeah, am I, am I thinking about it correctly or? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you can still make copies of it, but you like you know, in R sixteen, you probably have to like make a copy method or something that specifically do that, right? I think huh. that's how it works. But hmm. interesting. I'm not one hundred percent sure about that. Is there an R six copy function? Yeah, you'd have to use. The, well, it has a clone method. A clone. That's method. what it was. I knew there's something in, in uh, Python. It's called copy. In any event, um, yeah. So that's basically that. Uh, quickly, there's this very quick slide about method chaining uh, method because I can write that in our S3, we know how to do method chaining. Well, we can use a new pipe. <laughs> I should have updated this, but uh, we can use this pipe operator to help thread functions through, right? We do that with uh, dplyr and the rest of the friends. But in our, in our six, we can use this method chaining where the result of one method call push 44 is the same object again. So we can immediately call it with push 32, which gives you the same object back again. We can immediately call pop on it and it all works nicely. So that's one of the, another nice little advantage of R6, but I don't think it's, that's not a reason to use R6. It's just something, that's why I don't know. I'm sure why he would mention this like, oh, forget it. I need that method chain. No, you're not going to do that. 
Uh, so to, to summarize that R6 or S3 section, I would say this, use S3. <laughs> and, and a little less uh, silly, I would say use S3 unless you really find yourself needing these reference semantics. For example, to, to really in, to represent, to better represent state in the real world, right? So if, the, if my object represents a database, it doesn't make sense for me to have multiple copies of that database. They're all different. I should only have the one database and there should be some reference semantics to keep the database, the actual physical database in sync with the representation in the, in the, in the, R, in the R code, right? So when you, if that's the kind of situation you're dealing with, then you'll need to use R6. And I think that's what you'll find out in the wild, so to speak, where R6 is used. So, okay, good, that's it, use S3. But wait, what about S7? So I had to copy Hadley's uh, <laughs> use of this wonderful XKCD uh, comic, right? It's like, okay, how many, different object or, how many different object systems we have? Well, we should fix this. We need to have a new object system that will unify them all, <laughs> right? So that's what he, he actually, when he brought this chart up, he said, this is what he's trying to avoid, right? He's not trying to like somehow uh, fake the, you know, nth object oriented system for R. But uh, they have developed this new system, S7. And the primary references right now are still the R consortium. So this is still new. As you said in Slack, it's not actually on CRAN. You have to install it from GitHub, uh, but it's worth looking at and learning a little bit about I link here also this talk that you can find where Hadley Wickham talks. But yeah, this talk is actually pretty good because he starts from zero as if you've never used any object systems at all. He doesn't say, oh, you know all about S3, here's what S7 is. So it's, it's kind of nice. So what is S7 briefly? Well, very, very, very briefly, it's intended as kind of a better version of S3. It's like S3 with some of the strictness and some of the uh, helper functions from uh, that are similar to S4. But well, actually he says it best here, I just copy this from the talk. He says it's a little bit more complex than S3, but almost all the features, almost all the payoff of S4. And that was the intent, that was the goal. And looking at it, it looks like they really did achieve that as far as I can tell. Um, it's completely compatible with S3. So S7 objects, they're S3 objects too. Whatever you, you can redefine, uh, print using the S7 method, it'll still work as an S3 method as well. You can even extend an, an S3 object with an S7 object, which is come with somewhat nice. It's somewhat compatible with S4. There's some vignette that goes into details about that. Again, if you're not a bioconductor, you probably don't care. <laughs> but I should say the bioconductor was where is represented in this consortium. So they're they are they are making sure that. S7 can work for what they're doing, which is promising to me because maybe they'll switch to S7 as well and then we can have truly one, at least one functional. I mean, I'm okay with two, two well-used, well-traveled object systems, right? If it was S7 and then R6, that'd be great to my view. Because we can uh, over, if the, if the goal is to completely replace the S3 stuff with S7 someday, obviously that so much of R is S3, it'd be probably hard to do, but uh, let's see. Another cool thing with S7, which I noticed is, and Hadley also points out, is instead of spitting out uh, cryptic messages, they've, he's gone, they've done a very thorough job of trying to make sure that the error messages come back that are very helpful, which I thought was cool. And let's see, I just want to make a note that, you know, people still call it R7, but it has officially changed to S7. The reason for that is to reflect the fact that when you call it R7, people think it's a better R6. <laughs> But R6 doesn't, the R part of R6 is just the R language. The S part of S3 is the S language, but no one thinks of it that way. <laughs> so even though this is the R language, they're calling it S7 because it's a functional um, uh, class system, object system. So the other thing, the other thing too is just like searching. If you type in like R7, like yeah. I think it's related to like, uh, I think it's related to like a video game that's out there. I was like trying to find R7 yeah, stuff. S7 is like related to the Galaxy phone. So you get to do <laughs> that too. Yeah, so. I wrote S7 versus S4 <laughs> and I get all kinds of comparisons of phones. I'm like, okay, forget that. <laughs> so it's like, so it's, you got to do like S7, R7 R, or something yeah. like that. Like, and then it yeah. comes up, but it's just like, yeah, the R, R7 is just, but if you do like R7, our stats and you still get like the video game stuff so oh, really? it, it probably was it was probably smart to change it to s7 that's so. funny so i just we have a, a, a lot of time because i went very quickly through this chapter this chapter is very thin 
So I want to spend a little bit more time just on this slide about uh, based on the vignette that they provide on what our, what S7 looks like in case you haven't looked at it before. And also just so we can discuss it a little bit maybe, right? So right now you have to install it from GitHub, but it's pretty painless. I did this, um, it's easy. And then once you do that, you just need to call, you know, get to library S7, right? And then to define objects, it's as simple as this. It's similar to the way you do an S4 and that there's a special function for it, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. New class called dog. It has this awkward thing where you have to name the, ob the function or this object dog, which it represents the class, the same as the what you put in quotes here. And Hadley in his talk mentions that they tried a little bit to try to see if they can do somehow work around this, but the workarounds were worse and they just decided this is what it's gonna have to be. <laughs> so you have to have this repeat yourself thing, which is fine, but um, I don't know if there's any kind of checker. I mean, never really thought, I mean, maybe we find as long as there's some kind of checker. Huh? I think it does validate. I think I was reading, I kind of briefly went into like their introduction, the S7 basics one. Yeah. I think there is a validator like built in. So S7, if, if this is what you're talking about and I'm, I'm aligned with you, but seven S7 automatically validates the type of the property using the type supplied in new class, I think is what I saw. Uh, yeah. I'll, I don't know, I just tried it. it, it didn't seem to care. What I was talking about if I change this to cat, when I call this dog, it's gonna give an error and it doesn't. I, I guess that's not something that they Oh, uh, Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm off, because I'm, I'm looking at, like if it's trying to set the properties, it will do the automatic property check. Yeah, that, that is cool, that is really cool. So anyway, you set these properties, you give them names and you give them a type, that's more S4 than it is S3, it's right, in S3 you don't have to worry about types, but here at S4 you do, and they have these little predefined types for characters, for numerics, for all the built-in types, so you can do this, but it is a little bit of extra work here, uh, but it does pay off in what you just said, right? When you give it the wrong type, it'll actually give you a nice little simple error and built, like I said, a built-in validator. Uh, so let's see. Um, so to use it, you just simply call that function, that function, basically it is a function. You're defining a function here. There's also the constructor for the class. So it's all in one. And when I call it with name equal Lola, age equal 11, I get a dog back named Lola. And you can see here's the print. Here's a nice little user-friendly uh, structure of it too that comes back if you just type it by itself, right? That's very nice, well thought out. I really like this because it really shows you too, like, oh, if I want to get the name, clearly I should just do Lola at name. Right, because it's here, <laughs> it just tells me it. it's really nice. Um, so you can prop, you can set and read the properties with this at symbol, and it does do this automatic validation. So here I take Lola and I says her age to 12, I get back, you know, and I can ask for it, I get back 12. If I try to set her age to 12 written out, it says error. Now look at this, isn't this, I mean, this is just fantastic to me. I'm so used to these cryptic error messages, look at this. It tells you exactly what the problem is, right? It so much knows what it is, it, I'm surprised it doesn't fix it call chat GPT and find out what 12 is a number and put it in there now. <laughs> Maybe the next generation. Um, let's see, like uh, S3, okay, you define generics with new, uh, it has a different function called new generic, it's similar, but you define generics and methods. Um, you define a generic like this. Um, now speak is now gonna be a generic, right? Um, name speak. And then when I want to uh, define that for a particular case. I don't use the speak.dog like I would in S3. I, didn't, I use a special function called method and define that function, right? And I can then call it speak.lola. If I have another class, that's misspelled, um, you can implement the same generic for that. Here's a class called cat. Basically, it's the same structure, but different name. I can define a method for cats, speak, and it'll come back with meow instead when I say speak fluffy. So. Uh, and here's something else too, I thought was cool. If I did ask, what is speak? I just typed down the thing, I get this, right? You remember in, um, it's, it tells you what it is. It's an S7 generic and there's two methods to find on it. Now, if you did the same thing with an S3 generic, you get back, use method, <laughs> right? Use method, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that tells you it's a generic, but it's not, it's not quite clear what's going on. And it doesn't immediately tell you how many or what the uh, methods are. Uh, so actually, you know, one thing I'm wondering about is like, what is this X up here for? Does that mean it just takes one R? Oh, right, this is, um, this has to do with uh, what the generic will dispatch on. So 
that's something in the dispatch bin, yeah. So you can dispatch on more things, but that's just the usual case. I didn't mention this in here, but I just remembered is that is to use single dispatch is what I'm showing you here. And he, he says that he expects most people to be using S that are using S7 are going to use single dispatch. Only in special cases do you need the more advanced, advanced uh, multiple dispatch, or even, or even to be aware it, it exists. <laughs> so that's that part. Uh, and last thing he says about S7 is that most usage of S7 with S3 will simply just work. For example, I can define a method print. This, is an S, this seems like an S7 method, but it properly acts like an S3 method. I am a cat. So it just does behind the scenes exactly what you want, which is kind of nice. This way you basically say, so you just do the obvious thing, it should work, <laughs> right? Um, so the question remains, well, should we switch to S7 then? Well, maybe soon, right? But uh, right now it's still in development. It's not available on CRAN. You have to install from GitHub. If you use it, probably, you know, the person, if you have to share that code with anybody, they're going to be mad that you have, they have to go off and find this S7 thing because they're going to try install packages S7. It's not going to work. So, um, however, there are some arguments for at least trying it out. One of the reasons is to stay ahead of the curve, right? Get ahead of everybody else on this. So you kind of have some familiarity with it when it comes down. Um, maybe for planning ahead too, right? It will be uh, integrated, they say, into base R, but like I said, it's not there yet. And it might be, I don't know, who knows how, a year out? I don't know, soon TM. Another reason to try it out is you maybe you have some feedback for the team, like, well, wait a minute, this is not quite what I expected. Um, why does it do this? Maybe they can either answer that or maybe that'll give them some uh, some reason to change something, right? Because I know right now the team is probably so familiar with the thing that they're used to it now. So they probably would love for other people to, to start using it. I know they actually, that's what they said, please start using it and give us some feedback, but not, you obviously you wouldn't probably want to use it anything that you're gonna, you know, production ready. But that's okay because most of the stuff that I do, and I probably a lot of people do, are just dude, they're the only consumer of that code. The results somebody else sees, but they're not sharing that code necessarily with other people, which gives you no reason why uh, you couldn't start using S7 if you needed some of that. Um, ben, like I said in the third bullet point, if you need to get some of the benefits of S4, right, with all of that complexity, if you need it, you get a little bit more complicated thing you're working on, you might think about using um, S7 for that to get some of that out of there. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of the bottom line. If you have some new project you're working on that's a solo project, it might need some more complexity, then you might consider also using S7 there. But otherwise, I think the final uh, answer from this chapter is still you know, use S3 because that's gonna be the least friction for everything else in the R universe currently, at least for the foreseeable near future. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Ron. I was going to say that's basically all I had. So I'd love to discuss these things though some more. Yeah, I the the thing that I had was just like there. I was going through some of those minutes and stuff, and I think that they mentioned that they were advocating for it to be implemented in base R, but I don't like. Oh, okay. I don't. I, don't, I thought that. it was actually a true plan. But you're right. Maybe that's a Is goal. it a true plan? Maybe, I don't. Well, maybe yeah, you're right. Maybe I just but... misread it because it's a goal and not a plan. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm sure it's a plan because I mean, that would be like ideal, right? Like if you could get it into the base R system, then it's just part of the landscape. It's not like a separate package like R6 is because R6, you have to have the dependency. Yeah, you're right. It, it says the long-term goal is to merge S7 and base R. And it does say so long-term. So that's, yeah. So I wonder if that's why it's not necessarily on CRAN or it's being pushed to CRAN is because, so there's not confusion of is S7 a part of base or is it actually like a package and you have to create it as like a package dependency. And so, I don't know, that's a good question. It's interesting because like they've been yeah. working on it what, for about a year, year and a half or something. Yeah. But like you, but there's actually since the last meeting was in September, they haven't done much since then. Mm. But they've had longer gaps before, so I guess that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it's open source, so yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. it's not like it's not like it's, it's, it's a paid software or something. So. It's very nice, clean, uh, clean specification. I think, though, I can imagine making it much cleaner without making it less useful. 
Yeah, and I mean, it's like it. What's nice about it is it, it like combines all. Of, it pretty much combines all of S three and S four together, right? And it makes it like if you know those base class, or if you know those class, or if you know those OOP systems, it should be pretty quick to yeah. pick up S seven. So. Unless like, unless like some of the more like advanced stuff, like if you're doing like multiple dispatch or inheritance or something like that, well, wouldn't, this wouldn't necessarily have inheritance. Oh, it, it does. It does. So there's it more, um, I mean, there's more to the thing, validators, inheritance, dynamic properties, you know, just like S4 uh, has a dynamic properties. Um, and, and S3 too. But, um, yeah. Yeah, because that's what I was wondering. Like maybe maybe some of the nuances will come with like the more advanced features. Like they're, they're like the there. I just, didn't, I just wanted to show the quickest basic part of it. But yeah, properties, dynamic pro properties are implemented in a nice way. That the properties are doing the properties like this with name lists is the is a kind of a um the simplest way, but you can also define them as proper properties that can have getters and setters and everything else. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I, I wonder too, like, and again, like, I don't know, like, like, just like you, I only really read like the first intro part of it. So I don't know all of it. I wonder if it's like, if those properties are, well, would it be, would it, would it be basically making these objects global, like S3, S4 would, or is it more encapsulated like R6? I'm guessing it's probably more global. Yeah, no, it's the same principle. Right? Methods are still generic. Generics are still generics. They're still global. Hmm. That makes sense. Because that, that's just like the interesting part about it is just like, you know, you have generics that are available to you that, that like print or predict or whatever that are still available to you based on the object that yeah. you have. And so you're still leveraging the R landscape with the system rather than like creating like a completely new system that doesn't rely on other things that might be available. So that's, that's really nice to have as well. Um, Let me see here. Um, I was just going to share this real quick. I can find the right thing for it. Where is it? This? Yeah. So this, this is in the vignette right here. Well, actually this is the, this is for the reference, but um, in the, in the, um, oops, this thing got away. Eh, go away. In the, um, can I go back to the vignette? Yeah. So the simplest possibility, like you said, of defining properties the way I did it in the in the slides, right? Start equals class double, but it's really a shorthand for this new property function to define new properties. And the reason for that is you can then add more stuff like default values, like uh, like uh, it doesn't show here, but. Here, right? Default values, so that's that's mm. nice, right? Or computed properties like getters and setters and things like that. So it's all kind of uniform properties are probably not not some separate active list you have to give. It's all in the same the same list, which is kind of cool. Mm. It's better organized in that way, I thought. Yeah, that's that is a lot more organized, which is yeah. I mean, it gets at the heart of it, like S three flexibility with a little more structure <laughs> but you see you dial in the, as much as you want right i mean <laughs> if you if all you need is this that's all you need you're good right but if you need oh i need a getter and setter i need to make this properties more protected and whatnot i can i can do this so what's nice about the syntax it looks like that's encapsulated within the class yeah. right yeah which is which makes it it it's more like r6 in that sense like that's why it was easier for me to like grasp R6 than S3, granted S3 is really simple, was is that they're not separate functions. Like it's the syntax yeah. itself makes it seem like it's encapsulated in that class. So it made it so much easier to like understand it. So yeah, I agree. Instead of like having a getter setter separate function. And so, um, which is really nice to have, like, it's just really nice to see it all in one object. Like you're like, it's this one class, object so yeah anyway i mean so i think I, I think if i do run into a situation where I'm, i need to do something a little more complicated than s3 will do then i might try this out some more myself just to just just to sh you know shake the tree so to speak yeah to see just to give it a try most certainly so 
Well, let's see, Ryan, do you, do you have any other comments or questions or anything that you want to add? I think Ryan's still with us, right? Yep, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, I uh, I mean, I'm just kind of hanging on. I, you know, I think it's, I'm, I'm, I don't have any questions. I'm sort of just taking it in. Sorry. No, I right. just, I'll go ahead. I was going to say, Ryan's already at the very first slide. He's like, yep, I got S3. <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, I um, no, I think if anything, I've learned what not to do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, like Stone said, it's like there's there it's pretty much functional programming for himself, unless you absolutely, absolutely need an OOP, which I think I'm kind of in the same boat as well. There's only a few applications where I could see needing OOP, but hey, it's available to you. I'm I'm really interested in the in these next in this next section the metaprogramming stuff because I feel like this is stuff that I run into uh, quite significantly like quite a bit like just doing functional programming stuff and so I'm really excited to kind of dive into this stuff and talk about it because I think it's I think it's it has a lot of application in the work that I do so super excited about this coming up. I don't know. I'm right. just kind of curious. Do any of you guys use Torch, our Torch? Torch. I haven't heard of it. What is it? Oh, it's a, a machine. It's a neural network package, deep learning package for. Or there's a book club going to start on it at some point, or there's talk about it anyway. Um, and I'm just thinking that might be a place too where uh, R6 might be used. I don't know. I don't have it installed, so I don't know how to, to find out. I'm looking at the web page. Because it does talk about you know zero copy methods and all that. So I mean, there's an issue there with like memory usage because these tensors here get really big. That's another. That's another place where you might want to use an object, more of a encapsulated object system. But who knows? They may have written their own written their own system for that. I don't know. Yeah, that's so far outside of my wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm not familiar. I haven't heard of it, but it looks. It looks really cool though. I mean, I know there's a lot of those like modeling package, you know, modeling packages that are out there, you know, especially like tidy models, which, you know, is the, the tidyverse, um, you know, modeling set of tools and stuff. So I don't know, it'd be interesting to, like I said, I, like I was telling Ryan at the start, it's like, I've just been so our programming focus that I've kind of moved away from the modeling portion. And so I would definitely like to oh, really? find yeah, well, I mean, like outside of just like work and stuff, like most of my study has been like the R, like the R language and R programming, and, and it's kind of moved away from like statistics and modeling oh. and stuff. And so, we're just looking at the source which, code. They're using, I guess, they're using S7, but they're using it when it's called R7. Oh, really? Yeah. For Torch? Yeah. That's funny. That's the other thing, too, is just like having that as a dependency is on your package, like, yeah, if you use R seven, like you can't because it's not on CRAN, so it's not you. It can't be a dependency. So you'd have you have to do something special. I can't remember what you have to do if you are going to ask users to install that. You have to like do something separate. I can't remember the exact what you have to do, but it's in your description file. You can't have it be as an import because it's not. It's not. I might be saying this wrong because it's not part of CRAN. So they have to download it as like a separate dependency. It looks like they just included the source of it, like an earlier version of it. They've yeah, I was seven, looking at that. They got R7.R file. It's just got all the stuff in there. <laughs> which is like this collate. I have no idea what that does in the description file. Huh. Interesting. That, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Yeah, R7. It well it points to it points to something in the R the R directory, which is R7. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the source code for that. It's only like 120 lines. It may have nothing to do with S7 and R7. It might be their own little R6 plus one. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Anyway, I digress a little bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, like, I mean, like, if if there are certain if there are certain groups that are already like implementing this and stuff, it looks more like um, R six because even the name R six R seven class is similar to like R six class, right? Mm -hmm. I just don't know enough to know. 
Oh yeah, and they make a new environment in there. Yeah, so okay, yeah. This is not this is not S seven. This is their own thing that they made up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bump up of our six. The next one, R7. yeah. Like they said, there's always another object system. I wonder how many object systems there really are. Like you, you I remember like you said in the video. I remember I remember Hadley saying something about like there's a there's quite a few, but I just like wonder how many are actually out there. Uh, who knows? There's probably someone maybe probably wrote their own that's not even anywhere near Cran or on GitHub. Yeah. So. Anyway, right, I guess cool. we're we finished the um, object oriented section of this. Now we can move on to the very easy going, uh, you know, light material at the end of the book on meta programming. <laughs> I, I think I personally like I'm excited for this because I've already kind of right. read ahead yeah. because I've kind of read it I've read ahead a little bit because I know it's going to take me a little bit to like digest this but it's like I think it's really cool the idea of like and we could talk about this like when we get to it but like the idea that code is data and you can you can you can use that data to manipulate whatever you want and so I thought that was kind of kind of a neat idea um but the question is, is like, what can you do with that? And like, just seeing all the different things that you can do, it's just like, okay, this is going to get, it's going to get interesting. You can definitely write some very obfuscated code. I guarantee you. <laughs> we don't have like, any idea what you're doing. <laughs> well, yeah. And then like, you can modify your expressions and yeah. like, you can modify, like, you can modify the evaluation and like, it's just, like, I'm just like reading it. I'm just like, I think I asked a couple questions about it. Like, something about like the like data masking and like how like how that term is used and like how the masking yeah, part works did, yeah. and that's like that like threw me off too like data masking that means something completely different than what I thought it meant so. oh yeah like and it's but it's like the idea of like it was like the idea that it's environment masking and but like you know use ours might not be as familiar with like environments and how that works on the back end so like yeah, I don't know. I think I think June. I think it's June Cho. He had a really good, like he had some really good input on this too. Yeah. You know, but it's. I think it's just going to tie everything together because now it's like you have to know the syntax of your code and like how you can use that. Yeah, how you can leverage that syntax to modify code. And I don't know. I run into this all the time because I always find that that part of like the language especially if you're like programming with if you're programming with like tidyverse stuff like tidyverse functions that's where this really comes into play because they leverage a lot of this meta programming yeah. stuff behind the back end where you, but then like it works great for interactive data analysis but once you start putting it into your own functions then it just gets to be like a whole like other realm of like tools that you need to use like and to me, I don't think it was as clear like three, four years ago how to actually do that. And so, because there was like the bang bang operator, there was like the quotient, there was like the walrus. There now, there's like the double curly bracket notation. It, it's just like, but so I think this would be good to kind of better understand how all this stuff is implemented. So, yeah, I agree. Well. I, and then I think also too, John posted this in the advanced R and I think I might see if I can participate within it, but like there's the R lang package. They're gonna do a club focused on going through that documentation cover to cover. So yeah, depending on that. the time, yeah, depending on the time I might, I won't lead it, but I think he said he was gonna lead it, but I might at least sit in on it and go through it with them too, so. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. All right, guys. We will see you in a week. Yep. We'll see everybody in a week. Uh, Ryan, see looking ya. forward to you taking 17. Yep. No. Yep. 17. 17. And then I'll see everybody next week. So have a great right. day. Take care. Take care. Bye. See ya.